Good morning and welcome to the 22nd meeting of the Public Audit and Post-Legislative Scrutiny Committee in 2018. Can I please ask everyone in the public gallery to switch off or turn to silent their electronic devices? Item 1 is decision on taking business in private. Do members agree to take items 3 and 4 in private this morning? Thank you. Item two is Scotland's Colleges 2018. I'd like to welcome our witnesses today, Paul Johnson, Director General Education Communities and Justice, and Aileen McKechnie, Director for Advanced Learning and Science, both from the Scottish Government. Dr John Kemp, Interim Chief Executive of the Scottish Funding Council, and Andy Whitty, Director of Sector Policy from Colleges Scotland. Now, each of the three organisations are going to make a brief uh, opening statement this morning. And can I ask Paul Johnson to start, please? Thank you very much. And I'm grateful for the opportunity to provide evidence to the committee in response to the Auditor General's report on Scotland's Colleges 2018. Um, I am the relevant accountable officer for the Scottish Government and have responsibility for ensuring that the Scottish Funding Council's strategic direction is aligned with the priorities of the Scottish Government and that it has the necessary controls in place to safeguard public funds. The accountable officer for the Scottish Funding Council is uh, Dr John Kemp, and the Funding Council is accountable for the delivery of Scottish Government policy objectives, for the deployment of resources to deliver these, and for associated planning and risk management. I welcome the Auditor General's report. It highlights uh, what is working, where ongoing work needs to be concluded, and where there is scope for further improvement to be made. Colleges make a vital contribution to the government's commitment to improving the lives and the employability prospects for many of Scotland's citizens. Scotland's college sector is one that is continuing to develop new and enhanced relationships with employers in areas such as curriculum planning, work experience and employability skills. Colleges have a clear role in delivering the skilled workforce that we require to generate inclusive economic growth. I'm pleased that the report identifies that the sector has continued to exceed the national target for learning and highlights the significant role that the sector is playing in widening access to learning with the proportion of learning hours to students from areas of deprivation, um, from ethnic minorities and those with experience of care or disability all continuing to increase in the 16-17 year. Student satisfaction remains high with over 90% of full-time and 94% of part-time students satisfied with their college experience. The report also emphasises that there is regional variation in relation to student attainment. This is a complex area and there's an interplay of many factors, including deprivation and labour market conditions. But the government is determined to see attainment figures improve for all learners and will continue to work closely with the Funding Council and the sector to drive this forward, building on emerging learning from our National Improvement Project. I'm happy to leave it there, uh, given the other statements that you have, and I look forward to answering any questions. Thank you very much. Dr Kemp. Thank you for the opportunity to discuss the Auditor General's report this morning. The, firstly, could I say that the Scottish Funding Council accepts all of the recommendations in the report relating to SFC and has already implemented some of them. The report has many positive aspects. Our colleges are generally serving people well. Over 90% of students are satisfied with their college experience. The majority of college leavers are in a positive destination six months after graduating. Colleges continue to excel at widening access to both further and higher education. And there was an increase of 43% in care experienced enrolments in 2016-17 compared to the previous year. And a doubling in the number of senior phase, senior phase age pupils studying vocational qualifications. SFC has used its outcome agreements to work with colleges to encourage and support these changes. And we will continue to do that. We do recognise that there are challenges. Colleges operate in a changing world. 
The sector will need to continue to make sure that they are delivering the skills that people need through learner journeys that involve working even closer with schools and universities. We um, in SFC and the Enterprise and Skills Strategic Board want colleges to be part of the upskilling system for people in work as well, and we want to develop that further. Most importantly, we want to improve success rates for students. Colleges support some of the people with the lowest prior attainment before they enter the system, but we should aspire to do better and improve success rates for all. SFC will continue to work with colleges to deliver all of these things while remaining financially viable. Um, and I look forward to discussing how we do that with you this morning. Thank you. Andy Whitty. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you for the opportunity to provide evidence to the committee uh, on behalf of Colleges Scotland, which is the voice of the college sector. Scotland's colleges have an incredible depth and variation to them, and whether that comes from access level courses to degrees, professional development, modern apprenticeships. College learners have many diverse requirements and it's through their flexibility that colleges provide the high quality courses which meet the needs not only of learners but also communities and employers. The Scotland's Colleges 2018 report details many positives for the college sector in Scotland as well as some challenges. The Audit Scotland report outlines tangible progress being made by colleges in key areas. It's encouraging that student satisfaction levels are rising at over 90%. And 95% of confirmed college leavers going into positive destinations of employment, further studying or training. And that colleges have surpassed the Scottish Government's learning activity target of a little over 116,000 full-time equivalent learners. We embrace diversity in the college sector and the Audit Scotland report confirms that the proportion of credits being delivered to students from ethnic minorities with care backgrounds with disabilities and from deprived areas is increasing. Attainment levels for SIMD 10 and SIMD 20 have increased for both full-time FE and full-time HE students since 2011-12 and colleges continue to play a significant role in widening access. There are some financial challenges outlined in the report for colleges. Colleges Scotland is working in partnership with Scottish Government and the Scottish Funding Council to help deliver a sustainable funding model which will enable colleges to continue working with employers and producing the skilled workforce our economy depends on while providing considerable benefits to students. Colleges are making a significant positive impact on Scotland's inclusive economic growth agenda Fraser Verlander Institute report published last autumn concluded that college graduates contribute an additional £20 billion to Scotland's economy over their working lives. And uh, happy to engage with the committee this morning. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Whitty. I'm going to ask Ian Gray to open questioning for the committee. Thank you, convener. So one of the um, key aspects of the Auditor General's report this year was that colleges were in a better financial position than, for example, uh, a year ago uh, when she reported. But she does raise some concerns about the sustainability of the financial position of the sector uh, going forward. And notably, she notes that um, all of the savings from the reform programme, the mergers, um, and uh, most, if not all, of the increase in revenue funding which has been provided will be uh, absorbed by the costs of national bargaining and harmonisation. So is it fair to say that our colleges have in fact no increase in funding uh, in order to deliver their core functions? Paul Johnson. Um, I will, I'm certainly um, happy to uh, take that um, in that uh, I think it's important to emphasise uh, as you recognise that the financial health of the sector has improved. Um, the report really is quite different to the one that we were looking at this time last year. And there has been a significant real terms increase in revenue funding to the sector. Um, we absolutely recognise that uh, harmonisation has represented an investment in the workforce and that additional funding has been provided uh, this year to, uh, to, to deal with the costs of harmonisation. John Kemp. The Auditor-General is entirely right that the 
the, the savings from mergers a few years ago were 50 million, and the eventual cost to national bargaining is 50 million. Um, but it's important to recognise that these are two things, you know, some years apart, um, and that the additional funding for national bargaining so far has resulted in additional funding. So, I mean, it's not a cost. Um, I wouldn't like people to imply that, you know, the, the, the savings from the mergers are in, in fact, funding national bargaining. That isn't the, the way it's happened. Um, there is additional funding for national bargaining so far. There's another year um, you know, where it's to be implemented. Um, if the savings from merger hadn't happened, then we'd, we'd be you know, in a, a different place where national bargaining, if it was going to happen, would cost even more. The, the two things do cost 50 million, but they are quite separate. But the Auditor General is pretty clear that the real terms increase of 5% uh, on 2016 17 most of that also will be absorbed by the cost of national bargaining. Yeah. So my question was, is there any increase in, in funding really for the college sector at all? Yes, um, in that the for between 17-18 um, and 18-19, a large chunk of the additional funding um, has gone into national bargaining, but there is also an increase of 1% in cash terms um, to colleges to deal with financial pressures as well. So, yes, most of the, uh, the yeah, additional... Increase is 1% cash, not 5% real. The, well, the actual increase um, in academic year terms that colleges would receive, because we're funded on a financial year basis by the government, which is where the 5% the comes from. By the time you turn that into an academic year, it's nearer 10% because some of the the next academic year is in the next, well, some of the, that academic year is in the next financial year. So colleges have received an increase nearer 10% um, in real terms, of which a, a good chunk is going to um, national bargaining, you're correct. Paul Johnson. I would just want to refer to Exhibit 1 in the Auditor General's report at page 10, where um, it's pointed out that on the left-hand side, SFC income is described as up 6% from 15-16, and then on the right-hand side, staff costs are up 1% from 2015-16. I think that's quite a helpful uh, graphic, which does, I think, point to the additional investment that has been made. But in Key Message 4 on the previous page, the Auditor General says... A real terms increase of 5% on 2016-17, most of this is to meet increased costs associated with national bargaining. Yes, and I, and so, I, and so most of the uplift has gone to national bargaining. I mean, Dr Kemp says what's left is 1% cash. That's correct. Yeah, most, most of it has gone to the cost of national okay. bargaining. Thanks. So, Paul Johnson, I mean, you said in your opening statement that the money had increased, but the fact is it's not going to students. Is that right? Well, it's correct to say that um, most of the increased money is meeting the cost of national bargaining. That's in order to ensure that we have a workforce that is uh, able to support students. So I wouldn't wish to suggest that, that, the, um, that, that investing in the workforce is not providing help and support to students. So, Mr Johnson, how about the colleges that met the costs of harmonisation when it was proposed a few years ago? Um, because, for instance, Dundee and Ang Angus College in, in my area paid for this themselves, but then haven't received a kickback from the government. So are they going to have that money refunded? Well, I think it's quite important to... Um, note the distinction between some of the regional approaches to harmonisation that were taken and then national harmonisation. Now, I know that Dr Kemp has got more detailed financial information about what's happening with specific colleges, so perhaps I could turn to Dr Kemp for that it's, one. Yeah, it's important to draw a distinction between regional harmonisation and national harmonisation in that Colleges that harmonised internally, within, in the case of Dundee and Angus College, you know, within the, what used to be Dundee College and Angus College, um, didn't necessarily harmonise up to the same level as the national harmonisation, which happened um, a few years later. So the two processes were quite different. What is correct, um, and several colleges have raised this with me, is that colleges that have higher wage rates prior to the national harmonisation will have received a smaller amount of an increase um, between 1718 and 1819 than if they'd had a higher, um, sorry, a lower um, wage rate at the time. But the crucial thing there is, is not whether they harmonised at the time, but what the level of wages were in the college. 
almost every college, not, every college did receive an increase um, related to harmonisation for 1718. In the case of Dundee and Angus College, it was about two million of an increase related to national bargaining. And that reflects the fact that even though they, they had harmonised before, there was still a gap between their wage rates and you know, the, the level that it was harmonised to. And there was also a difference in the hours worked and the holidays and so on, which had to be paid for. So even though some colleges would receive more, in, in the Highland colleges, for example, the increase was about 20% um, between those years. For the other colleges, um, it, it ranged from about 5% up to round about 10%, and 10% was the average for the sector as a whole. So all colleges received some increase, some were bigger than others. It still seems to me that those colleges with good governance who could foresee and, you know, we're listening to government and, and implementing things as they went are being penalised financially. And that doesn't seem to me fair or a good signal to send from the government. And I think if, if we were over time just to freeze um, these increases as they are in this year and next year, you're quite right, that would be unfair. Um, the reason that we have given some colleges a, a bigger increase than others because they have a bigger gap this year. It's reflecting the very tight financial situation in colleges um, and you're trying to do this in the most e efficient way possible. But once it's fully implemented, our intention is to move to a funding system that's based on um, you know, a cost per unit of education, um, which is the same across Scotland, you know, with allowances for rurality and deprivation and so on. But over time, to move away from funding people based on what their wages were a few years ago to one that's based on what they're delivering. So, Paul Johnson, can I ask you that will you look at the colleges who attempted to make um, early uh, arrangements for this and see if they have been financially penalised and put that right? Well, I can certainly, uh, I'm, I'm conscious that um, uh, my colleagues in Scottish Government and colleagues in Funding Council are in regular dialogue with uh, colleges from across Scotland. Um, where, there, where colleges wish to raise particular issues with us, then of course we will consider them carefully. Thank you. Willie Coffey. Thanks very much, Convener. Uh, I suppose it's really very much in the same theme here, but in relation to Ayrshire College, uh, particularly to you, Dr Kemp, uh, I wrote to you to ask you for information about the colleges that did receive funding support at the point of merger, uh, and you're unable to provide me with that figures. It says here in your letter, it's not possible to provide an accurate costing for harmonisation at the point of merger, as the FCFC did not hold detailed records of staff numbers, etc., etc., why, why is it not possible to tell us how much was paid to those colleges at the point of merger who didn't harmonise? Well, the, the, the essential point is we didn't pay for harmonisation in most colleges. In, in my letter, um, which I sent to you recently, I did point out that there were two um, colleges where we did make a contribution um, towards harmonisation costs. But for most colleges in the 2012-13 merger programme, we didn't. The, what I was saying in the letter was we don't have because um, wage rates are something that were up to colleges and which we weren't funding directly we don't have an accurate costing of exactly what harmonization would have costed in every college and one of the things that has been evident as we've you know, assisted the colleges with national bargaining you know trying to work out exactly um, you know what the the hours worked, the um, contact hours, the holiday um, pays, and so for, for colleges, and adding that up into a national figure is is not a simple um, a piece of arithmetic. And we have done that now, but it wasn't done in 2012-13 for each college as they harmonised. It would have been done for the, by the college themselves, so they will know the costs. But we didn't fund it, so we don't have that. Um, are you sure about that? Because I've got the post merger evaluation document yeah. in front of me here and it quite clearly shows a table of those colleges who yeah. paid their own harmonisation money at that time. Yeah. Dundee and Angus is one of them, paid £750,000 at that time. Ayrshire College paid £565,000 at that time. There's about nine colleges in total who paid £4 million yeah. out of their own resource yeah. at that time and have continued to pay that as a consolidated I, harmonisation sale. How come you don't know that? Well, I mean, these, those are the figures from the colleges that were in the post-merger evaluation. What I was nervous about doing was validating those costs because it, it's been a tricky thing to do as part of National Bank. I accept that colleges did 
incur costs in harmonising. And we encouraged them to harmonise because it would lead to a better merger. It was part of our merger's guidance to do that. Um, it wasn't um, done as a, a precursor to national harmonisation, though, though many colleges knew that that was likely to happen. It was done because we encouraged colleges to do it um, in order to have better mergers. We do accept there are additional costs, and we do acknowledge that colleges have incurred those for some years. And you know, as, as I've said, colleges that ended up with higher wage rates um, as a result of harmonisation or other decisions at the time would have got a smaller increase in 1819 than if they hadn't. Um, and you know, we acknowledge that that is something that cannot persist and that in, over time we will need to find a way of moving back to a, a cost times price way of funding. But that's what you've just said there has kind of been confirmed by the Cabinet Secretary who wrote to me and said it's recognised that had Ayrshire and others not harmonised its terms and conditions at the point of merger, it would receive a higher level of funding now. And that would have been carried okay. on until the point where you began to make additional harmonisation payments. So what the convener asked you and what I'm asking you is, and to Mr Johnson, will you revisit that? Because clearly, in my opinion, and clearly members of the committee's opinion, that some of the colleges have suffered detriment as a result of their own good practice. The they, ha they have not got the same level of increase. Mean, Ayrshire College's increase um, was this year was 6.8%, of which 1.9 million was for the national bargaining cost. So there have been, let me, let me, to be clear, there have been some amounts of funding to Ayrshire and Dundee and Angus and other colleges that harmonised um, that is supporting the national bargaining. I do accept that that is less than it would have been had they had lower wage rates um, at the time that national bargaining was coming in. We do intend over time to address that. The issue is, do we retrospectively go back and address this for colleges that had low wage rates over the last five years? I think that would be very difficult to do, and I'm not sure how we would do it. Good up. I think, uh, Mr Coffey and I are looking for a commitment from Paul Johnson and Dr Kemp that you, you will look at this and come back to us and see if there is potential solution here for the colleges we mentioned. From, from, my, from my part, we are clearly committed to the success and the sustainability of the college sector and the individual institutions within it. That's a very it. wide we, statement, Mr Johnson. We're looking for a specific commitment on the issue we raise. Well, I was wanting to emphasise, though, that we, clearly we are looking at an overall financial settlement that that, that has constraints. But I, I, as I've said already, we will absolutely look at the specific issues that the committee have raised today and uh, happy to engage directly with the colleges. And indeed, if the committee wishes further information from I us, then we'll provide it. I think that would be good, because I don't think this government would want to be penalising good governance. And I think this is what's happened here. Colin Beattie. Thank you, I'd like to have a look at the uh, question of repairs and maintenance, which is a very obvious uh, highlight out of the Auditor General's report. From looking at paragraph 25, just look at the headline figures. Your, your uh, uh, estates condition survey in December 2017 identified £163 million pounds of, of repairs and maintenance needed over the next five years. And the first thing that jumps out at me, to me is, if they take into account fees, inflation, and other costs, suddenly it becomes 360 million. That's more than double. How does that work? If, if you actually want to affect these repairs, you have to take into account more than the actual direct cost of affecting the repairs. Fees, VAT, contingencies, optimism bias all need to be built in if you're going to have a realistic costing of what it will do. Uh, what what costs will be incurred. Um, so the way that we approached this was consistent with the Treasury Green Book, um, you know, ways of looking at optimism bias and, and, and costing for fees. I think had we done it the other way around and said there's 163 million backlog there um, and then said actually it's going to cost far more than that to deliver it later on, I think we would have been dishonest. So the 163 million didn't even include VAT on the works to be done. No, no, that's the, that, the, that's the way it was worked out. That was yeah. 163 was the direct cost, and then VAT, um, optimism, bias, and so on, and fees were built on top. It sounds like an incredible increase to me, but uh, yeah. maybe that's the way it works. Looking at the high priority works, um, 77 million pounds identified over the next two years. How serious is high priority work? What sort of examples would that be? 
Well, the, the, the Gardner and Theobald report, um, which um, we published um, in December, categorises um, into very high and high priority. And very high priority is, is stuff that is, is essentially already failed, a roof that's leaking. And and high priority is the next one down, a roof that's expected to fail you know, within the next two years. But against the 163 million, it's quite a high proportion, this very high priority. It's about 20% 20, 20 of the, the 300, I think the, you're, I think you're quoting the, 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 the figure for the, as a proportion yeah. of the 360. I think it's important to understand which figure we're comparing that yes, 77 yeah. million against. It's, it's the, the gross figure, which includes the fees and the optimism <laughs> and bias. So yes, I mean, the, the bigger costs are in the, the low and medium priority, sort of which will, you know, be done in years three, four, and five, um, but yes, it's you know it's a significant amount. So if we'd say seventy-seven million over the two years, you're providing twenty-seven million this next year. Yeah. Are you going to be providing yeah. the funds the, for the second year? Yeah. The the twenty-seven million is for eighteen nineteen, <coughs> um, and that's already in place. We're not, we're in discussion with the government about next year's budget. Um, so I mean, I, I'm unable to say I mean, how much we will be able to allocate um, in future years. But the, the state's condition survey was commissioned and is there to, in order to give us a firm evidence base for discussions with the government on budgets. Andy Whitty. Yeah, I mean, the, the, I mean, you look across colleges and many have first class facilities which do reflect the investment that's happened already in the college sector, but that's not consistent. And clearly the state condition survey reflects that. Um, obviously grateful for the for the very high priority funding for this year um, the the 77 million uh, needed over the next two years following that for the high priority um, that became part of uh, College of Scotland spending review submission by putting <clears throat> half of that 77 million in for 2019-20 uh, so you know we're looking for that funding to be able to do those high priority issues okay, thank you Colin Beatty what extent is the, the government uh, committed to meeting those repairs over the next five years? Is there a plan to try and address this? We accepted the recommendation from the Auditor General last year that this work should be done, and it's good to see that the work has now been completed. Um, and indeed that the highest priority work is being uh, is now being addressed. Um, we need to consider the specific funding allocations as part of the this year's budget process. You, so you'll appreciate that I uh, cannot confirm today what the precise capital allocations would be for the sector, but I can certainly confirm that these issues will be considered fully as part of that process. Thank you. Liam Kerr. Uh, just on the same point, if I may, the, um, just to be absolutely clear, uh, because if I'm a college, I need to find 77 million or across the sector uh, sometime in the next two years because to deal with the high priority works. Am I going to get that or am I not going to get that? I'll, I think my colleague Aileen would like to add uh, something um, here. So I wonder if I just might supplement what Mr Johnson has said. So we are in the middle of a budget process. We are working closely with College of Scotland and the Funding Council to understand what the priorities are. As, as um, College of Scotland has said, they have bid for half of the 77 million. So that's in our thinking for, um, for the 1920 budget process. We are equally inside government um, thinking about an infrastructure investment plan for the next five years into which the Funding Council's report plays. So all of that is currently subject to discussion, but because the budget process is live for 1920 just now, and clearly we, you know, we cannot preempt um, further year budget processes, we can't commit. But we are clearly, um, as I say, working very closely with the sector and the funding council to understand what the needs are and how we might best address those. Liam Kerr, can you give me any reassurance with my college hat on as to when I might uh, know? whether I'm getting the money or not, in order that I can make business plans for my estate. So every college will hear, um, as you know, as other parts of the system will hear, when the budget statement's made in Parliament, and we expect that to be in December. Right. Uh, just a very final, a bit of a daft laddie question, if I may. The um, paragraph 27 uh, of the report 
uh, talked about uh, in Scotland's Colleges 2017, the Auditor General recommended the Funding Council produce some criteria uh, so it can decide where the, the funding should go. Uh, I understand that was produced in December 2017, uh, but hasn't been published. Has that now been published? And if not, when will it be? be included in Dr Kemp's letter. Yeah, the criteria was not for the um, disbursement of the, the 360 million, it was for new capital projects um, which would be over and above, would be for you know, replacement of campuses and so on. Um, the criteria were in the letter that I sent um, to the committee um, a couple of weeks ago and that included in the papers. There were also some of the factors that would um, be included in that criteria were also signalled in the, the circular where we um, published the, the estate condition survey back in December. Um, so we are still discussing those with College Scotland and haven't completely finalised them yet, but they are they're in the public domain now. Alex Neil. Can I uh, concentrate on one or two issues that have come up in the report? Um, First of all, the, the role of the regional bodies. For example, I noticed that Glasgow, which has got three colleges, spends £430,000 on a regional body. Uh, Lanarkshire, which has got two colleges, only spends 50000 So what is the value of these regional bodies, particularly Glasgow, and where's the added value for that money? Yeah. Uh, the, the added value comes in bringing the, the colleges in Glasgow together um, to have a coherent curriculum across the city, to plan that, to allocate funding, um, to fund that coherent curriculum, to offer one point of contact for businesses, for things like the Flexible Workforce Development Fund and Foundation Apprenticeships and so on. Um, so the intention and in the legislation that set up the, um, the regional strategic bodies was that if the SFC is to fund a region as opposed to a set of colleges in a region, there needs to be somebody, where, where there is more than one college in a region, there needs to be somebody that is pulling together the colleges in that area, making sure that they are funded at a local level to deliver the needs of that region, to be responsible for the outcome agreement for that region, um, and to um, ensure that the region is getting what SFC is funding. So that's the purpose of, of the RSBs. And you're, you're quite right to point out that there are differing levels of costs, and, and that Glasgow is the most expensive one. That's because Glasgow is all, actually, all three of the regional strategic bodies are unique, but Glasgow is the only one that is a separate board, um, that i.e. is not a university or, a, or an existing college. So it does have higher costs. However, those costs amount to about 0.4% um, of the funding that it handles, and that's broadly in line with the, the costs of the Funding Council. Um, so you know, it, it is a more modest cost than it could have been. And actually, if you look at the, the financial memorandum for the legislation um, when regional strategic bodies were being set up. They assumed that a regional strategic body would cost um, well over half a million. I think it was 560,000 was the assumed cost of a regional strategic body. And all three are operating well below that. I just want... Sorry, Alec Neil. I just wonder, you know, I, I realise it's 0.4%, but 430,000 pounds, you know, would help a few, quite a few students if it was uh, given to them in terms of bursaries. So, uh, why, you know, in, I'm perplexed. In Lanarkshire, it's an average of 25k per college, and yet in Glasgow, it's well over 100k per well, yeah. well over 100, nearly 150k per college. It's Where's the added value? It's absolutely right that we consider you know, every pound that's spent on administration and whether that could be better spent on provision in colleges. Um, but Glasgow and Lanarkshire are in very different circumstances. In Lanarkshire, there are two colleges, and 80% of the provision is in one college, you know, the larger one, New College Lanarkshire, which is the regional strategic body. So it's a different model um, in both cases. And actually, part of the reason there isn't um, a, a separate strategic body in Lanarkshire is to save on administration costs and have a leaner model. That, that's, that's why it's done that way. Aileen McKechnie. Mr Neil, if it might be helpful if I just list some of the successes we've seen from Glasgow. So clearly the regional board has produced its strategy. I'm sure you and other colleagues will have seen this and if not, we'd be happy to share it with you. Um, so this is its demonstration of ambition for the city region of Glasgow. So successes include 
right across college, working in curriculum planning and organisational development in student experience and delivering developing the young workforce and student data systems and regional capital distribution and regional approaches to procurement and shared services and collective delivery of foundation apprenticeships and a collective approach to the delivery of our ambitions around early learning and childcare and collective approaches to delivery against the flexible workforce development fund. So there's a long list of activity that the regional board is driving in a collective pan-Glasgow way across the three colleges. And they are significant in terms of scale. You know, we reduced in, uh, through the reform 10 colleges to three. So I think it's really appropriate that we have a body that sits across that and really drives the collaboration and alignment that we need to see to get the maximum benefit for the Glasgow City region. Could that be achieved without this extra bit of bureaucracy? And I'm not convinced it wouldn't be. So, so I think that that's a fair question. So what we are currently, so what we have currently. Um, Commissioned, just recently commissioned the Funding Council to do an exercise of understanding better um, the, the, the value delivered and secured from the regional bodies and the regional system. So that's a live piece of, of, of work. That Is that being done by outside consultants? Well, I don't think the Funding Council has you know, determined. Yeah. 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 Right. But we will do that. So I've got um, a meeting with the college chairs, the Funding Council, College of Scotland and the College's Development Network next month to have a comment. We will have a conversation as a collective about how okay. do we best do that? How do we best understand um, what we deliver, how we deliver it, how we secure best public value from the delivery of that regional approach across Scotland? So that's a work that we're, that's a piece of work that we're now taking forward. Can I just ask more specifically about inside the colleges? Because clearly um, how the money is spent inside a college matters uh, in terms of maximising its impact on the local economy and local people. Now, we took evidence from New College Lanarkshire, which has not had its problems to seek and still hasn't resolved quite a number of those. I mean, the relationship between management and the staff is could only be described, I think, as appalling. Um, but one of the issues also uh, is that there seems to be a lot of money being spent on layers and layers of management. And we've had similar submissions, say, on Edinburgh College and down the years on other colleges as well, and not enough on the provision of the frontline lecturing services. Um, now, is that something you're monitoring? Are you looking to colleges? Because uh, I'm sure they're not the only two colleges in Scotland who may be a bit top-heavy on the layers of management and a bit light on the money that's percentage of the money being spent on the frontline service. Yeah. We we don't decide on the structures within colleges. No, I didn't ask if you no, decided. No, no. I ask if you monitor it. Yeah. You're supposed to monitor performance. We, we have, um, and as you'll know, when we... Um, when I was in this room talking about New College Lanarkshire, we did look in response to one of your questions at the proportion of staff um, above, I think, 60,000 and found that New College Lanarkshire is broadly average. There is a variation in the way that colleges um, arrange um, their internal management. Were we to be concerned about a college um, having an excessively heavy senior management? And I would stress that you know I've not seen you know, strong evidence that you know any... Uh, way out of line on this, then you know, we would be discussing that with the board and so on. But it's primarily an issue for the board and the management to decide on their structure. Um, and you know, they have the responsibility of running their colleges efficiently. Um, and you know, where, where we're concerned about inefficiency of any kind, we will discuss that with the, the, the college board and their senior management. I mean, you pick 60, it's a fairly arbitrary figure. I didn't say senior management, I said layers and layers of management. Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. there are some people who are managing one person, uh, mm -hmm. for example. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm not saying New College Lanarkshire is the only one with that problem, but mm -hmm. what concerns me is, are we maximising the resources that need to be spent on the frontline service? Because, I mean, for example, I'll give you an example. Um, in New College Lanarkshire, there was one class recently went for six weeks when no lecturer turned up. No lecturer turned up. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know how often that goes on in New College Lanarkshire or in other colleges, but I found that appalling. Now, that to me is rank bad management. Yeah, and it's that, that is, if, I mean, I, I wouldn't want to comment on that specific incident, but where, where things, if things like that are happening, we would be working with Education Scotland through. Um, how do you know you didn't know it was happening? Well, I, I didn't know about that specific one, but we, we are looking, you know, with Colleges Scotland um, at how 
the outcome agreements are being implemented by each college and you know, how they're supporting students um, and doing an annual engagement which would uncover issues um, you know, about students not being taught. Now, I don't know about that particular case and I wouldn't like to comment on it, but I'm happy to look at it further if you want. I, I think the other issue, John, is the relationship between management and the unions and, and, yeah. and the staff. Uh, I mean, again, it's not confined to New College Lanarkshire, but from the evidence we've taken, it's a pretty bad situation. It would appear there's ongoing situation, an ongoing situation at Edinburgh College and no doubt at other colleges as well. So what are you doing about it? About the relationships between management and staff and, and, and the consequences of that poor relationship? I mean, we actually had the principal in here a few weeks ago who actually described some of his staff as... Troublemakers, I think, was the phrase. Am I right? He didn't use that phrase. I think um, he, I used he that phrase. It. He endorsed it. He endorsed it. it. That's correct. Yes. Well, that's yeah. pretty well the same thing, isn't it? I, I was sitting next to him when he did it, so I remember. Dr. Kim. <laughs> well, relationships between staff and management in colleges are issues for staff and management in colleges. The funding council cannot get involved in that. We would encourage um, college management to work closely with their trade unions um, and to consult um, and to make sure that they are you know, operating in a collaborative way. But the prime responsibility there is the management of the colleges, the boards of the colleges, you know, to work you know, with their staff. College boards include staff members, so I mean, they are, you know, at the table when these discussions are happening and we would want colleges to be working as effectively as possible but the prime relationship there is between the management and the staff i'm not asking you to, to oh, just one more question one more i'm not asking you to micromanage the colleges clearly that would defeat the whole purpose of having college managements but mm -hmm. you you are the guardian of value for money for yep. the you are the accounting officer effectively yep. for all that money spent on colleges which is an essential part of an economy yep. And yet, I get the impression that your attitude is once you've dished out the money, it's less fair. I'd have to say, if you asked colleges that, they might say different. Um, I'm, I'm more often accused by colleges of being a micromanager than of um, running away and not asking what they're doing. Um, we, through the outcome agreements and through our work with Education Scotland, do look very closely at where that money goes, how effectively it's been spent, and whether it's meeting the skills needs of an area, whether it is delivering what students want. Um, there is always a balance to be struck between what is the role of the, the senior managers and the boards of the colleges and what is the role of the funding council. But I, I have to say, I'm more often accused of being a micromanager than the opposite. Ian Gray. Um, I wanted to um, move away from finance as such a little bit. Mr Johnson, in your opening statement, you said that as accountable officer, your responsibility was to ensure that the sectors uh, the sector was aligned with the policies of the Scottish Government and were delivering uh, those policies. Now, um, in the college sector, there was a pretty clear government policy, which was a concentration on full-time courses uh, leading to employability uh, qualifications in students aged 16 to 24. And in previous years, we've discussed the consequent, this committee's discussed the consequences of that which was a very significant drop in student numbers, around a, over 140,000, 150,000 at the, the peak, um, with the decreases in part-time and older students. However, um, that seems to have changed, um, and this year the Auditor General reports an increase in part-time students for the first time in a number of years. Um, however, she also points out that 70% of that increase uh, is an increase in students of school age, 16 and under, uh, and um, uh, rather, rather than uh, older students. Uh, my question really is, uh, is, is there any clarity about government policy in terms of what it's requiring colleges to do? And I'd quite like to know uh, from Mr Whitty if the college sector feel they are clear about what the government is asking them to do because it does seem to be changing all the time. 
well, I would accept that there was a very deliberate decision to concentrate on uh, full-time courses for young people a number of years ago, which reflected the labour market conditions at the time. I'll turn to my colleague Aileen McKechnie in just a minute, because uh, this year we did uh, make changes to the letter of guidance that was sent to the Funding Council, quite explicitly asking them or recognising the need to widen out the uh, range of individuals uh, to whom uh, college um, uh, placements would be offered. Now, there's always been a range, but it has indeed, as the Auditor General recognises, widened further. But I do, it may be helpful to have some specifics on what we asked the Funding Council. So, um, in our outcome agreement guidance letter to the Funding Council in October last year, we were quite explicit in saying colleges are not required to prioritise full-time provision for 16 to 24-year-olds, but rather should be responsive to the current needs of learners and the economy. And that was to enable the sector to respond to the emerging um, conclusions of the Enterprise and Skills Review um, and to respond to the strategic board's emerging strategic plan and to enable the system to respond to changed e economic Needs. So, we, you know, as you know, as Mr. Johnson has said, at the time that we introduced the focus on on, on young people, it was at, you know at, at peak recession, and we felt it was an appropriate thing to do. And I think the fact that we've achieved our developing the young workforce target. Um, four years early demonstrates that that was a successful exercise and that was absolutely supported by, by the college sector in terms of delivery. But we recognise that, you know, that the, the economy has changed and we need to refocus um, and enable the college sector to refocus its efforts in terms of, in terms of reaching out to a wider economic um, requirement. And, you know, we are working closely with the, the college sector in relation to the strategic board's expectations about upskilling and reskilling of those in the workplace. And the College of Scotland is represented on the strategic board to allow the sector to hear directly some of the emerging policy thinking as it is being developed. Um, I mean, the college sector responded to uh, the developing young workforce direction of government policy and, and understood and was, was happy to do that. Uh, I think, as has been explained, uh, you know, the labour market is changing and I think the increase in part-time um, students, whilst um, the majority at this point are under 16, I can touch on that in, in a moment, I think the increase in part-time um, learners is reflective of the work-based learning and the in-work um, contribution that uh, colleges can make, which is going to be absolutely vital for driving up productivity uh, in the Scottish economy. And I think also colleges have a very strong link uh, through to SMEs, which are the, the, the backbone of the Scottish economy. And so um, the, the increase in part-time courses uh, is, is a positive, uh, part-time learners is a positive development in, in those areas. Um, Yes, there's a considerable number below 16 years of age uh, at this point, but that's through the stronger links between uh, schools and colleges through the developing new workforce, which is uh, providing a need to help skill people in the areas and to, to help them find the, the, the right place for them to learn going forward. So it's, it's trying to uh, provide what's needed in order to build that skill base going forward. That's a contribution that colleges traditionally made in which the college sector, at, at, at the instruction of the government, stripped out the contribution to uh, in-work learning, increase in productivity, returners to work, all of that. Are, are, are you saying, Mr Whitty, your, your understanding is the government now wants you to put all of that back in again? My understanding is that we, the, the college sector was responding to Scottish Government policy direction for developing new workforce, and we uh, understood that and supported that. As, as labour market needs change and Scottish Government policy needs change, we will be responding to that as well. And, and I think that's what we're seeing the start of, uh, and that's what colleges have the flexibility to be able to, to deliver on, and ultimately will be a linchpin in delivering that need. So, so those 140,000 students who were stripped out of the college sector and the Auditor General in the past has said those uh, were largely uh, women, um, uh, people with disabilities who were affected by that change. Is the Scottish Government saying they want to put that activity back into the sector now? So, 
so we are not saying we are retreating to a position that we were in, um, you know, before before we introduced the reform piece and before we um, we introduced our focus on, on on young people. What we are saying is that um, the college sector needs to be flexible and responsive to the needs of economic shift. The college sector has always delivered part-time places. We have uh, we have encouraged it to um, be thoughtful, and that's part of the regional ambition. What is the regional need? So every college region delivers slightly differently. That's part of you know that's part of the expectation because of the geography, because of the economic impact and the economic need. Um, we are working, as I said, closely with the strategic board and the college sector to understand what the national need and you know, what the, the regional fit might be into that. And that will absolutely, our emerging thinking from the strategic board is that there needs to be a greater emphasis on in-work upskilling and retraining. So the, you know, the, the bulk of the workforce that, you know, is, is, is in, in terms of being ready for the jobs of the future, the jobs that we don't know yet, what they might be, are, are already in the workplace. So how do we, how do we train those in the workplace better? So you know, there are live conversations with the college sector about what its offer is, how it might flex. So there's something about, you know, learners coming in for full-time or part-time um, learning, but people in work being able to access upskilling and retraining so that they are better able to progress through the workplace or into, into other types of, of occupation and opportunity. Okay. Ian Gray. You feel that's, that's a clear strategy for the sector going forward because it, it doesn't sound very clear. It sounds as if the sector has been asked to make a very significant strategic shift and now has been asked to do something different all over again. So, that, that must make, if I was a college, I think I would feel that makes it quite difficult to, to, to plan my activities. John Kemp. I mean, I think the college sector is a very adaptable sector. It's, it's a sector that responds very quickly to change. The change that we were talking about earlier, about prioritising young people, was 10 years ago. Um, and that has worked through the system and, by and large, the number of part-time and older people has stabilised over the last few years. What we're now talking about is the emerging conclusions from the strategic board of pointing into a different direction. And it's it's not starting from a base where all places and colleges at the moment are full-time for young people. There are still 200,000 people on part-time courses in colleges. Now, that's down from where it was 10 years ago, but it's still a fairly strong base. The issue that we now face is how do we use the capacity in colleges to respond to the current economic need rather than the economic need there was um, 10 years ago. And, you know, we were working with the colleges. This is not done, um, you know, coming as a complete surprise to colleges. We're working with colleges on this so that they can adapt. Dr Kemp, foundation apprenticeships are an integral part of the discussion we've just had, are they not? They are, yes. They are, okay. And um, Paul Johnson, the national target for 5,000 foundation apprenticeships, has that been met? Um, I don't have that figure in front of me, but I'll so see if my colleague Elaine McKay. It's due to be met this year. Our ambition absolutely is to secure 5,000 FAs by um, next year, I think. Okay. Um, Do you know how sure far we've got? Specifically. So from memory, we are um, a third or more of the way through. I'm looking to John in case okay. he has... Because FAs are funded by SDS rather than um, the Scottish Funding Council. Yes, but remind me who exactly is responsible for delivering foundation apprenticeships. They are commissioned by <coughs> SDS. Um, they are largely delivered in colleges, but yeah. often the commissioning is through local authorities. Okay. Paul Johnson, would it surprise you if I said that um, for Dundee we have a target of approximately 250 and approximately only 13 foundation apprentices at the moment? Well, I think that's something that we should absolutely take away from uh, based on what you've said and I'd be happy to uh, write to the committee to provide an update on how does, we're getting on with the Does target. that represent the situation with foundation apprenticeships across the country? Well, I Aileen McKechnie. So it's mixed across the country. I think that so the foundation apprenticeship we introduce as part of the Developing the Young Workforce programme. So it's a new qualification. It's equivalent to hire. Um, we've had to engage hard um, in terms of the system, schools, colleges, employers, and teachers and parents to understand what it is, what the value of it is, why their their young person would want to take up a foundation apprenticeship as opposed to a hire. 
so that exercise in marketing, promoting, okay. influencing choice but if is you're a work in progress. Fair enough. But if you have to reach the 5,000 target by next year, then the figure of approximately 13 out of target 250 in one area must surprise it's you. It's, I, so I wasn't aware of that, and that is disappointing. I will take it away okay. and, and, and look into SDS, as Mr Kemp has said, is, is the lead agency for this. Um, and you know, and it has offered assurances about ability to deliver. But I think what we want to be clear is that um, you know, whilst we have a target for foundation apprenticeships, that what we're delivering is for the is the best outcome for the young person. It worries so, me greatly because of the situation we have with youth unemployment and opportunities for young people. That that figures can be as stark as that and so low. So, if you can commit to looking at that and coming good. back, yeah. that would be that would be good. Uh, Bill Bowman. Uh, thank you, convener. My question, I think, is principally to Dr. Ken, but maybe Paul Johnson would want to come in as well. In your submission, um, you talk about the college's financial position and the remarks made by the Auditor General, which I must say concerned me at the time, about the um, college's inability to calculate their underlying financial position um, consistently and also that the um, forecasting returns did not use common assumptions. So, I mean, to me, that means that if they could not calculate the underlying financial position consistently, some were doing it right, some were doing it wrong, and if you're not using consistent assumptions, you're comparing apples and oranges. Now, a lot of the discussion today has been about finance and what goes where, but if we don't actually know the base information, then I think, you know, we're struggling a bit. You say that you have addressed these recommendations. Now, I'm hoping that's more than a stern memo to the colleges to do something, and perhaps to use your own phrase, here's a time for a little bit of micromanaging. Can you maybe tell us how you're making sure this is done? Yeah, actually, it might be fair to describe this as a little bit of micromanaging, in that in, in the, the financial forecast guidance that went out after the Auditor General's report was published, that went out in July, um, was far more detailed on how colleges should work out their, their forecasts going forward and the assumptions they should make. That Previously, there were a range of things they could look at um, and they, they would interpret them in different ways. And, and, and in defence of the college sector, I would say that um, in the year that um, the Auditor General was looking at, it was quite a difficult year to make assumptions in that, if, depending on whether you were optimistic or pessimistic about national bargaining being funded, you could end up in a, quite a different place with your financial forecast. So it was a very difficult year. So what we've done this year um, in our guidance is be far more specific about the assumptions they should use and give a far more detailed set of you know, almost spreadsheets that they, they should fill in and how they should treat things in their accounts. So we, we you know, the, the guidance is um, up on our website um, you know, for all to see and you know, it, we are anticipating that it will lead to a far more um, robust and comparable set of financial forecasts from colleges. Now, the deadline for those was um, last week. Um, they, they came in on the 28th of September, so we are now working through them. But I, I'm anticipating they will be far more consistent in how they've treated um, you know, what is likely to happen over the next few years. I think my concern is with the term guidance yeah. as opposed to instruction. Yeah. Is it closer to instruction? How would well, you know that they are actually doing it? Well, the college boards do have responsibilities to manage their own finances and you know for their own um, financial sustainability. So um, I wouldn't want to go too far down the line of instruction from us. It is very specific guidance that says how they should treat particular things. And if they don't treat things that way, they would need to explain to us why. But colleges are independent bodies. You no, know, they are part of the public sector and subject, you know, to you know, the Scottish Public Finance Manual and so on. But they are independent bodies. And we would want colleges to be managing themselves, um, to be entrepreneurial and so on as well. So we need to strike at the correct balance. But on this, we need we need to understand what their financial forecasts are. So we have been very specific. So are you supportive of this? Uh, absolutely. I, I absolutely agree that consistency is important in, when it comes to forecasting um, so that we can get a clear picture of the sector as a whole. So I welcome the work that um, has just been described and my expectation is that that will deliver improvements going forward and I'm sure that's something that Audit Scotland will continue to be uh, commenting on. Okay. Liam Kerr. Oh, uh, 
I'm going to move Sorry. on, if that's okay. Liam Kerr. Uh, very briefly, if I may, I, I looked when Audit Scotland were in about the gender balance on boards. Uh, and uh, because what we looked at in the report was that all but three fall short of the statutory gender representation legislation. Uh, could you tell me what is the timeline within which colleges need to change the composition of their board or comply with the legislation and what happens if they fail to do that? Aileen McKechnie. I wonder if um, I might say a few words about what we're doing to seek to improve mm. that position. Um, because we, like you, recognise that it's that it's not good. So we are working closely with um, College of Scotland, CDN and the Funding Council alongside the chairs to encourage greater diversity across boards. We offer advice from our public appointments team um, and from the Commissioner for Ethical Standards and Public Life. Um, we invite board members to our on-board conferences um, and we make clear our expectation about shift in diversity on boards in our annual ministerial letters of guidance. We are holding our second annual event um, for college chairs and vice chairs in November, and one of the key items on the agenda is the Gender Act uh, and the gender balance on boards, which we discussed the last time we met. So we work closely to encourage shift and change. Um, we use these events to share good practice and learning, and one of the case studies on that day will be from Dundee and Angus College, um, outlining its success in taking forward diversity. So it's really shifted its approach to how it advertises and recruits, and it's changed, um, it's changed the balance on its board quite substantially. CDN is responsible for offering colleges, colleges Development Network, responsible for offering training and development to all board members, um, and they are working hard to encourage boards to be more thoughtful and creative about how they advertise, because part of the issue is about, is about the number of applications you get, so you can only select from the pool um, that, that's placed before you. So there's a lot of work going on in terms of being thoughtful and creative about what, how adverts are, how they look, what they say, and where they're placed, and that that matters, and you know, and how you reach out. And the other thing that we are working hard on is talent management, succession planning. So, how do you identify um, individuals? And it's uh, you know, gender balance matters, of course, it does, but diversity in the widest sense equally matters on board. So, we're thoughtful about diversity in in the widest sense in terms of how we encourage people to um, apply to. Boards. Thank you, Andy Whitty. Context around this, this is in on college uh, boards has increased by nine percent since 2014. So over the last four years, it's moved from uh, females being 35 uh, percent of boards to 44 percent uh, of boards. And so I think there's a, a strong direction of travel there. Clearly, there's still some work to do, and Aileen's outlined elements that will help continue to drive that but actually there's a good progress towards um, that 50-50 that split on college boards. Liam Kerr. I hear the point. Uh, could you just clarify, just uh, again, because there'll be colleges watching this, so what is the timeline by which they have to have complied with the objective and what happens if they fail to do that? My understanding is it's 2022, they need to get 50% by the Act. And it, so that's, that's my understanding. But equally, we have previously articulated an ambition for 50-50 by 2020. So we are not comfortable being slow in, in terms of delivery, which is why we, you know, the, the, the long list of activities that I outlined earlier are part of, you know, a, a hard drive across the sector to really ramp up um, the, you know, the, the, the diversity and balance across sports. Because, I, as I say, I wouldn't be comfortable saying that, you know, we are happy to wait till 2022. I think we are, you know, the actions that we have in train um, demonstrate that we are, this, this is an area that we think is hugely important um, and that we want to drive change. And as, you know, as, as Mr Whitty has said, we are seeing change and improvement, but there is more to do. Thank you very much. Willie Coffey. You know, could I return to the financial uh, matters and raise the issue of the PFI contract that Ayrshire College have? It's the perhaps the last millstone around the neck of the college from a bygone era, but nevertheless, it's having a major impact. Uh, it's mentioned by the Auditor General in her report, uh, and it's providing a significant challenge for the college. I wonder, either Paul or, or John, are you aware? of the letter sent by the college, signed by the students, signed by the union, signed by the management, warning of the dangers of, of, of what could happen yeah. in Ayrshire okay. College if this yeah. isn't addressed. We're it's talking about a sig potential significant reduction in workforce. Um, it could damage the services of the college that we're able to offer its students and so on and so forth. What's being done to try to 
address this problem. So I am aware of the issues that you've raised and uh, they will be considered carefully and I know that uh, uh, that Dr Kemp is looking into them just now, so perhaps he can say a bit more about what he's doing. Yeah, and I, I wrote to um, Heather Dunk, the principal at Ayrshire College, yesterday um, in response both to that letter to the First Minister, um, but also to one she'd sent me on a, a similar issue um, the day before. We have been working very closely with Ayrshire College, recognising that there is um, you know, a, an additional burden on that college caused by the PFI um, contract. That contract has been there for some time. It's been dealt with by Ayrshire and its predecessor colleges um, you know, for well over a decade. Um, that said, given the very tight financial circumstances that all colleges are in, we are working with Ayrshire to look at potential solutions. And for 1819, there is a solution in place where the receipts um, from one of the buildings that were surplus because of the new campus is funding it for 1819. We are in discussion with ways of help with them on ways of helping them in the future. Um, and, I, I'm, and as I've said in my letter. Um, um, to the principal, I think it's very premature to be talking about you know, reductions in staffing on the scale that are mentioned in that letter at this stage, given we are currently in discussion with the college about potential solutions. Uh, the, the funding support so far is a one-off payment yeah. in the receipt from the old Kilmarnock College yeah. building. That's a one-off. It doesn't yeah. address... No. Problem, John, as you well know. I, I know you guys were. It addresses it for 1819, I acknowledge at, that. At the yeah. time, but we managed to buy out the West Lothian College PFI a number of years ago to the tune of £27.7 million. Pounds because, as you say in your letter, John, eh, this was unaffordable for the college. Surely yeah. this PFI contract is unaffordable yeah. for East Ayrshire. Yeah. For Ayr for Ayr for Ayr I accept it's a burden on Ayrshire College. The scale of the burden is quite different. In, the, in, in Ayrshire College, as the Auditor General says in the report, it's about 4% of their income. The West Lothian one was about 20% of the income. So it, it is a heavier millstone. That said, we do recognise the burden on um, Ayrshire College and are looking at ways that we can come up with a, a different solution. That might not be buying out the PFI because this one's far more advanced and that might not be the cost effective way of doing it. But we do need to look at ways of supporting the college. But just if you don't mind, Convener, the, the payment that, is, that Ayrshire has to make is about 2.2 million. Mm -hmm. But West Lothian at the time were paying 2.7 million. So yeah. Ayrshire's payment is less yeah. than what West Lothian's was. But yet we managed to buy that one yeah. out. Curiously, in March 2007, yeah. just before the election? <laughs> I, I wasn't involved in the, the West Lothian one, but, but, but uh, West Lothian was a far, is a far smaller college. That was 20% of their income. It is a smaller burden on Ayrshire. That said, I am yeah, accepting that it is a burden and we are discussing with the college's ways that we can yeah, mitigate that. Do, do you finally do you accept that it's, it's a bit of a double whammy that Ayrshire are having to face in, the, in relation to the harmonisation element that we've already discussed? And this millstone that's still hanging around their neck. I wouldn't. I, I don't want to be trapped into saying double whammy, um, but I, I'm accepting that Ayrshire has particular financial challenges, as do many other colleges, and we will work with Ayrshire to address those. Thank you very okay. much. Okay. Can I thank our witnesses very much indeed for your evidence this morning? I now close the committee's public session. Thank you.